Dear students, today is May 6th. It's the second lesson of the seventh week. Today, we're going to talk about separation techniques. Our objectives for today, describe and explain methods of separating mixtures, such as filtration, simple distillation, evaporation, and paper chromatography. Keywords, filtration, residue, filtrate, distillation, condenser, distillate, evaporation, chromatography, filter paper. What do we mean by a mixture? A mixture contains two substances that are not chemically joined together. As an example, I have sugar water. Sugar water is formed from sugar mixed with water. There's no chemical bounds between sugar and water. All what happened is I put or I've mixed the sugar and the water in the same container. As there's no chemical bounds joining the sugar and the water, I'm able to separate these substances back. I'm able to get the sugar alone and water alone. How mixtures are separated? Mixtures are separating by using physical methods depending on the type of the mixture. Let's explore some of these techniques. What do all of these pictures have in common? They all have filters. Here in this car, I have this filter which prevents solid dust particles to enter. In the teapot, I have a filter which prevents the solid tea leaves from mixing with the water. And in the filter in the coffee mug, we have this filter which is preventing the solid coffee grains from mixing with water. Accordingly, solid particles are separated. Salt which is dissolved in water is formed from solid particles dissolved in a liquid. Am I able to separate the salt by using a filter paper? In order to know how does a filter work, I have these three pictures. All filters have empty spaces. If the object has a size smaller than the size of this empty space, this object will pass through the filter, such as water. If an object has a size larger than the size of these empty spaces, they are not able to pass it through the filter and they stay on the top of the filter. Accordingly, the size of salt particles is smaller than the size of these empty spaces inside the filter and then the salt will pass. Accordingly, both water and salt are able to pass through the filter paper and water and salt will stay mixed as water and tea are mixed together and able to pass through this sieve. So, separation techniques are physical methods used to separate the different substances in a mixture. As an example, if I have water and salt mixed together, I'll use a separation technique to get the salt alone and water alone. For sure, there are no new substances which are formed. The choice of the separation technique depends on the nature of the mixture and the physical properties of the mixture's components. The technique with, which is used to separate one mixture is different than the technique which is used to separate another mixture. Let's discover these techniques together. Filtration is a separation technique that uses a filter to separate an insoluble solid from a mixture. Best examples of components separated by using filtration is 
separating the coffee beans which settle down from the liquid coffee or separating sand from water. And to filter, we're going to be using a, a setup that is going to use a, a, some filter paper. And we've got our uh, funnel right here. We've got, I've got a glass funnel. Notice that I've got my ring stand with my ring hooked up to it. I have uh, a beaker that I'm going to hold my liquid in. And I've got a filter paper. I've got a filter paper. I'll show you how to use the filter paper in a little bit. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my setup. I'm going to bring down my ring so that the funnel is a little slightly, just slightly in the beaker. And then I'm going to place the beaker so that the funnel is touching the wall of the beaker. Again, what I want is I want the liquid that begins to drip down to run down the wall of the beaker. I don't want it to splash. All right, so now setting up the filter paper. Okay, to set up the filter paper in here, uh, I'm also going to need uh, my wash bottle. Uh, I'm first going to um, squirt um, my funnel real quick so that the filter paper will stick a little better on there. Okay, you can see there was no splashing. In this case, it's water on water, so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to have to dump this out. All right, so now I'm going to fold my filter paper into quarters. So here's, I folded it into half. So here, fold it into half. And I'm going to fold it into half again. Okay, fold it into half again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first, right, I've got one, two, three layers that I've made, right? So I'm going to take the first layer, and notice that the first layer will give me a good cone right here. So now I just open it, and it gives me a cone shape, a funnel shape. Now I'm going to place it in the glass funnel and I'm going to press it gently against it. I don't want to tear it. And for the funnel paper, for the funnel, uh, for the filter paper to stick to the funnel, I'm actually going to have to add a little bit of water and I'm going to have to wet it, okay? And that will allow my filter paper to stick against the walls of the funnel. So now I'll just very gently push against it. I want my paper to really stick against the walls, but don't tear it. Careful not to tear. All right, so there it is. So now what I can do is, once again, uh, being very careful, I'm going to use again my uh, chemical spatula. And this time I'm placing the chemical spatula all the way down into the filter paper, right? And I'm going to pour a little bit at a time so that it only goes halfway up the filter paper. Right, I stop. Notice that the water is coming down, starting to come down. Uh, I don't want to go above the filter paper, so it's safer to just go halfway up the filter paper. Filtration takes quite a bit of time. Now, this isn't against the wall, so I need to adjust it. There we go. I shouldn't see dripping down. I should see a stream coming down the side. And so once uh, the water or the liquid level has gone below the half, I can add a little bit more and I can continue to filter the liquid here. Um, the filter paper we're using is very fine, and so it does take a while uh, for the liquid to come down. So if we ever do this in class, you got to be aware that this process takes some time, and you got to be patient with it. You've got to do it right. All right, so I'm going to let it run down just a little bit, but um, I want to show you, again, notice that this liquid is kind of cloudy here. This shows us that there are some small particles that are suspended in the water still, some particles of sand. And I'm just going to remove this and put it to the side for now. You can still see there is some water, but I just want to show you uh, the difference. So I'll pour this out. We're not going to do this anymore. Uh, and I will show you the difference. You can see how this water is much more clear than this water. This one's kind of cloudy. This one's clear, and this is the water that has been filtered. The filter has been able to catch those smaller particles, those finer particles of sand that were still suspended in the water. And so those are the two. Already we arranged that in each filter we have empty spaces. In a filter paper, 
These empty spaces are so tiny and invisible, so they are called pores. If the substance above this filter paper has a size larger than the size of these pores, this substance will stay on the top of the filter paper. If this substance has a size smaller than these pores, it will pass through the filter paper. When I have sand and water, the sand has a size larger than these pores and will stay on the top of the filter paper and it's called residue. Water, water particles have a size smaller than these pores in the filter paper. So water particles are able to pass through the filter paper and they are called filtrate. Accordingly, sand particles are separated from water. I'll get the sand alone and water alone through filtration. So guys, we arranged that the substance that can move through the filter paper is called filtrate. In order to pass through the filter paper, the size of this particle must be smaller than the size of the pores. The substance that is left behind in the filter paper is called residue. Residue particles have a size larger than the size of the pores, so they won't be able to pass it through the filter paper. This process is called filtration. Right now, pause the video and draw and label the apparatus with these keywords in your science copy book. So guys, did you draw this picture on your copy books? Your picture must contain first an Erlenmeyer and a funnel. Inside this funnel we have a filter paper. Already I have a mixture of a liquid and an insoluble solid inside, such as water plus sand or water plus insoluble coffee beans, water plus tea leaves. Water will pass through the filter paper, so it's called filtrate. The insoluble solid is not able to pass through the filter paper. It will stay on the top of the filter paper and it is called residue. So if I'm trying to separate water plus sand, water is the filtrate and sand is the residue. If I'm trying to separate water from insoluble coffee beans, Water is the filtrate and coffee beans is the residue. If I'm trying to separate water from tea leaves, water is the filtrate which passed through the filter paper and tea leaves is the residue which is stood on the top of the filter paper. Filtering is not only used to separate water from sand. We have filters in cars, vacuums, and tumble dryers too. What do you think they might be made of? What do you think they might be filtering out? In order to use filtering technique, we must have filters. Again, all filters contain empty spaces. If the object has a larger volume than these empty spaces, this object is not able to pass. In cars, we have air and oil filters. They help to filter out any impurities. So any impurity which has 
a size larger than the size of these empty spaces, this impurity won't pass. In vacuums, there are filters to trap the dust. In tumble dryers, there are filters to capture threads and hair. Threads and hair have a size larger than the size of empty spaces of this filter, so they are not able to pass and kept alone. Accordingly, threads and hair are separated from the mixture. Do you remember how particles are in a liquid? In a liquid, particles slide past one another. What will happen when these particles will absorb energy? This energy is used by the particles to move faster and far from one another. When this energy is enough, the liquid will turn into gas, according to a process called evaporation. So evaporation is the change of state from liquid to gas. In order to evaporate, this liquid must have enough energy to overcome, to overcome the force of attraction between the particles. Do you know what does this picture represent? It represents halite. Halite means a rock of salt. Mainly this salt is sodium chloride, which is the table salt. Usually table salt is an ACL. Is an ACL an element or a compound? As it's formed from two types of atoms, the first one is Na sodium and the second one is chlorine Cl. This means that it's a compound. Why do these two letters stand as a symbol of one element? When the first letter is capital, the second is small, this means that these two letters form one symbol of one element. Similarly for Cl, when the first letter is capital, the second is small, this means that these two letters will represent one symbol of one element which is chlorine. Again, an ACL, the table salt, is formed from two elements. The first one is an A sodium, the second one is chlorine Cl, so the table salt is a compound. Do you know how this rock is formed? It's formed by the evaporation of water. Let's discover it together. Have you ever heard of salt lakes? A salt lake is an inland body of water. It is formed when water with a lot of salts flows in. So here we have a salt lake where water evaporated and salt stood on the surface. Already we know that salt is extracted from the sea. How do we separate the salt from water? The seawater is exposed to the sunlight. Water will get enough energy and escape as a gas and the salt is left on the surface. Accordingly, the salt is separated from the water and I'll get the salt alone. Already we arranged, when I have an insoluble solid, such as sand, sand is separated from water by filtration. But if I will try to separate water from salt by filtration, both water and salt will pass through the pores of the filter paper. So filtration doesn't work to separate water from salt. In order to separate water from salt, we'll use evaporation. Evaporation is used to separate a soluble solid from a solution. As an example, to separate water from salt, to separate water from sugar, during evaporation, the water evaporates away, leaving solid salt behind. 
One disadvantage of evaporation is that the water can't be collected. Look at the water, how it escaped as a gas. As we arranged, during evaporation, water will escape as a gas. But what if I need to collect this water? I'll use simple distillation. Simple distillation, unlike evaporation, is the method used if we need to collect the water from a salty solution. The simple distillation is formed from two steps. The first step is boiling the liquid and the second step is condensing the water vapor. Accordingly, I'll get the water alone and the salt alone. Let's watch this video, then we'll continue. Let us perform an activity to understand simple distillation. Take a mixture of acetone and water in a distillation flask. Put a thermometer in it. <laughs> Connect the flask to a water condenser. The condenser has cold water running through its jacket to keep the temperature cool. Keep a beaker at the outlet of the condenser. Ah. Heat the mixture keeping an eye on the thermometer. When the temperature hits 56 degrees Celsius, acetone starts to vaporize. These vapors condense in the water condenser. The condensed acetone gets collected in the beaker. When all the acetone vaporizes, water is left in the flask. Acetone is collected in the beaker. In this way, acetone and water get separated by simple distillation. Ah. Oh. <laughs> huh? Boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. Boiling point of acetone is 56 degrees Celsius. As there is sufficient difference between their boiling points, these components can be separated by simple distillation. Simple distillation does not work properly when difference between two boiling points is less than 25 degrees Celsius. This is because the components do not get separated and purified completely. If we repeat this process multiple times, we will be able to separate these two components. However, as this is very time-consuming, a special type of distillation called fractional distillation is used. Mm. Ah. <laughs>
Simple distillation is used to separate salt from water or to separate two liquids which are miscible. What do we mean by miscible? Miscible means two liquids which are dissolved in each other, such as water and acetone. The first step is heating. Accordingly, the liquid will absorb enough energy and boil to turn into vapor. To ensure a smooth boiling, we use marble chips. A thermometer is used to know the temperature of the liquid. When the temperature is equal to the boiling point, we'll know that the first liquid is evaporating and turning into gas. Done with the first step, which is boiling. Right now, this water which boiled and turned into gas will condense in the condenser. So here we have cold water which is entering and going out from a jacket surrounding the water vapor. So the vapor which is in this tube will be in a cold place and then water vapor will condense and turns into liquid. To sum up, how do we separate salt from water by simple distillation? Water is heated, so water will boil, it will turn into vapor, and then this vapor will condense. Accordingly, I'll get distilled water alone and salt will stay in the distillation flask. Again, what's happening during distillation? Distillation is formed from two parts, boiling and condensation. During boiling, the water is heated until it boils. It changes into gas. The gas passes inside the condenser. Here I have the condenser. The second step is condensation. The gas will cool down inside the condenser and it changes into liquid again. So in order to change from gas to liquid, we need a cold place. This cold place is ensured by cold water which is entering through that jacket and going out. What is that jacket? That jacket is a part of the condenser which is surrounding the tube where water vapor will pass through. That jacket contains cold water to ensure a cold place and then the vapor will condense into liquid again. Accordingly, I'll get the salt alone in the distillation flask and water will boil and condense and will be separated alone. Chromatography. Chromatography separates substances that have different solubility, such as a mixture of ink. The technique requires a filter paper and a solvent. Let's watch this video together, then we'll continue. This video shows an example of a chromatography experiment. The goal of the experiment is to separate the different pigments of ink which are present in a wet erase marker, which we'll see right here. Uh, so a vis-a-vis -vis marker is wet erase, which means that the pigments are water soluble. We'll start our experiment by drawing a line with the marker on the chromatography paper. Then what we want to do is insert that chromatography paper into a beaker with a small volume of water in it. We can see that the water will start to rise up the chromatography paper because of capillary action. You'll note this is happening very quickly because this is 16 times speed playback. Uh, we can see that the ink, which originally looked black, is starting to separate into different colors. This is because the different pigments have different properties. Some of them are heavier, some are lighter, some are more soluble in water, some are less. Because of these differing properties, all of the different colors are going to travel at different speeds. 
And uh, by the completion of our experiment, we should see some very nice separation of the different pigment colors. Now, to do analysis of our results, what we're going to want to do is to measure the distance traveled by each pigment. Let's pause here for a moment. Uh, so I want to measure the maximum distance traveled by the water and then by each different pigment starting at the line drawn on the paper. To be fair, we should be comparing the distance traveled by the water starting from the same point where the pigment started traveling. So we'll measure all of our distances starting at this point. Uh, looks like the maximum distance traveled by the water reaches about to here and then we can measure the maximum distance traveled by each of the different pigments. How to perform paper chromatography? We'll start by putting a small amount of the solvent in a beaker. Then we'll draw the base line by using a pencil. Why do we use a pencil? Because the graphite is formed from carbon, which are particles which are not soluble in the solvent. And then the baseline will stay drawn at its place. If I'll use a pen, which is formed from ink, the ink will be dissolved in the solvent and this line won't stay at its place anymore. Then spots of the substance are placed on the line. I'll keep a space between the different spots. Then the bottom part of the filter paper is placed in the solvent. The solvent will pass through the filter paper. As water is Passing through the filter paper, it will take the different parts of the mixture with it. Particles which are heavy and less soluble in this solvent will travel for a short distance, while light substances and substances which are more dissolved in this solvent will travel for a longer distance. Accordingly, the different particles which are forming this ink will be separated according to how much these particles are able to travel through the solvent due to the different solubility of each particle. In what paper chromatography is used? Let's take this example. Some dyes called A, B, C, and D have been banned because they cause health problems. In a food industry, chemists want to investigate if a substance X contains the banned dyes. They did chromatography and got the following result. What conclusions can we draw from the results? Identical dyes produce spots at the same height. So, X, B, and C contain this blue dye. Accordingly, the substance X contains the same substance which is banned in both B and C. Both X and C contain the same substance which is in brown. So the substance which is banned in C, the brown substance which is banned in C, exists as well in X. And both X and B contain the same substance which is in purple. So the substance which is banned in B, the purple substance which is banned in B, exists as well in X. So X has the similar blue substance which exists in B and C, X contains the same banned substance, which is the brown one which exists in C. X contains the same banned 
purple substance which exists in B. Which one of these substances is pure? In A and D, I have just one spot. So A is formed from only one substance and then A is a pure substance. D is formed from only one substance and then D is a pure substance. The level of this substance in A is different than the level of this pure substance in D. Accordingly, A and D are different from two different pure substances. In B, I have two spots, which means that B is formed from two substances mixed together. C is formed from two spots as well, which means that C is formed from two substances which are mixed together. Blue substance is common between B and C. The substance X is formed from three spots, which means that X is formed from three substances mixed together. How chromatography is used in real world. Crime scene investigations use chromatography to separate out blood samples, ink, and even powders from the explosions. Chromatography is very useful in restoring old paintings, as the paint can be separated out to know which substances were used and whether any restoration has already taken place. Right now, let's check your understanding. Name each technique from A to D. Pause the video and then continue when you'll be ready. Did you write your answers on your copy book? Let's check your answers together. What is A? A is filtration. What about B? B is chromatography. C represents evaporation. And D, simple distillation. Part two, decide which technique you would use to separate the mixture in each situation. Pause the video, write your answers, then start it again when you're ready. Did you write your answers on your copy book? So, how to separate salt from water? I just need salt alone, so I'll use evaporation. Water will evaporate and I'll get the salt alone. How to separate sand from water? I'll use filtration. Particles of sand are larger than the pores of the filter paper, so sand will stay on the top of the filter paper and it's called residue. Water will pass through the filter paper and it's called filtrate. Accordingly, I'll get the sand on the top and water alone. How to separate water from sugar water? If I need the water, I'll use simple distillation. So I'll get, I'll get the water alone, which will boil, then condense. So I'll get water alone and sugar will stay in the distillation flask. How to separate food dyes in sweets? I'll use paper chromatography. The different particles will travel through the solvent, heavy 
and particles which are less soluble will travel for a short distance while light and particles which are more soluble will travel for a longer distance and then each dye will be separated alone. Here you have the answers written. Here you have the answers of part 2. Right now, I have a challenge for you. I need to separate a mixture of salt and sand. Can you think how we can do that? So we'll add water so salt will be dissolved. We'll filter out the sand by filtration. So I'll get the sand separated from the mixture on the top of the filter paper. We'll evaporate water and then the salt will be separated alone. So already we have salt and sand in this jar. They added water. Accordingly, the salt will be dissolved. A filter paper is used to separate the sand from the mixture. So sand particles have a size larger than the pores. They are not able to pass. Sand particles will stay on the top of the filter paper while water and the salt which is dissolved in it will pass through the filter paper. So the filtrate here is formed from water and salt dissolved in it and the substrate is formed from the sand. So already the sand is separated from this mixture by filtration. All sand particles will stay on the top of the filter paper and will form the residue. Right now, water will evaporate and salt will stay. The salt will be separated alone when water will evaporate. So here I have the salt alone when water evaporated. Accordingly, the salt is separated from the mixture. Guys, follow this link for an amazing experiment related to chromatography. Let's watch these parts related to this activity together. Hi kids, today we're going to do an experiment with chromatography. Remember, always have your parents with you while doing an experiment. Here's what you'll need. Some water, a coffee filter, some popsicle sticks, some markers, some food coloring or other ink, a pair of scissors, and some clear glasses. First, Cut your coffee filter into strips like these. 